This morning, I'd like to talk about images of the cross. Yes, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. It has become cliche, and we can almost say it without flinching. But what does it mean that Jesus died on a cross? The cross is a symbol. Now, I want to take some time to focus this morning, to focus all of our minds on the symbol. But in order to do that, first of all, I'd like to put us in the mood for thinking deeply about symbols. So here's a symbol, has nothing to do with the cross, but let's just think about what this symbol means for a moment. Let's walk through this. Well, we have a symbol of a heart, and heart usually has to do with love. That's a Valentine's Day heart. It's not a blood pump heart. It has to do with love. And here we have hands in the shape of a heart. And hands usually have something to do with doing. And these hands are suggesting loving people because we have not just one person represented here in this picture, but we have a number of people. And you might say that it doesn't matter what color these people are. There are different colors, and you might focus on those different colors and say, well, it does matter that there are different colors represented here, or you could say it doesn't matter at all because they're just people. And they're people who are coming together for a purpose, and that purpose is to demonstrate love and to act out love towards mankind, perhaps. And different people will look at this image and see different things, and that's okay. That's part of what makes an image powerful and what makes it personal at the same time. Here's an image. Companies have images, don't they? Because they realize how powerful images are and how meaningful they can be. And we're not going to take time to analyze this one. We'll just move right along. Here's another one means something, and there are words that go with this image, aren't there? You can put words to that. <laughs> Some famous words. How did those words become famous? Well, they came, became famous right along with the image. If your parent, this, is, this one can be useful. You can use this for your teenagers. When you ask them to do something and they start whining, you just show them this image, and the words come to mind. Well, just do it. <laughs> just do it. <clears throat> Sports teams have images. Roll Tide. There are corporate strategies and corporate initiatives that have images. Countries have images. Political movements have images. But I want you to notice that something else has happened as you saw these different images flash on the screen that something has happened to you. Your blood pressure has been rising and falling as you've seen these different images. Because images can stir emotions in us, can't they? We thought, as we went through those images, we thought politics, we thought um, hatred, we, th we felt patriotism, all of these feelings arise as we look at these different images. Now let's consider a simple image and let's think about the image of the cross. It's iconic, it's packed with meaning, and that meaning has changed with time, hasn't it? Would you wear this around your neck this is an image of an electric chair pendant. Somebody thought to wear this around their neck. You would think that was morbid, wouldn't you? You would think that this was morbid to wear around your neck. But do you realize that the cross originally had that same meaning as the electric chair and the noose? It 
it originally meant the same thing. To the first century Romans, that cross was an image of execution, of death. But we wear it, don't we? So the question is, how did we get from this to this? How did the cross become a symbol of our faith and a symbol of what we love, a symbol of what we're passionate about when it was originally the sign of an execution? I want to take some time to look at some additional images to show what the cross was and to some extent is and then also talk about what the cross has become. The cross was a symbol of shame. And here's a passage of scripture that talks about the ridicule and the shame that Jesus experienced as he hung on the cross. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, Look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before us endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The cross was also a symbol of torture. I don't need to drag you through all that the Bible says about the torture that Jesus endured or the descriptions that we sometimes just dredge up from history of what happened to someone who was crucified. You can just see this device and realize that it was a bloody affair. It was a messy affair. It was a torturous affair. And that no one in their right mind would intentionally go through this. It was, a, it was the sort of torture that was reserved for the lowest of the lowest. It was intended to put you on display in the most uncomplimentary way possible. Having been beaten to a bloody pulp and hung, literally hung by hands and feet with nails on a wooden structure. And we know that Jesus endured that torture. He began teaching them in Mark chapter 8 and verse 31 that the Son of Man must suffer many things. And they had no idea when he said that what kinds of things he would have to endure. The cross is also, we don't have many symbols of curse in our society, but this is one that we probably, most of us would dredge up if we talked about a curse. This is a voodoo doll full of pins. And this is a modern voodoo doll. Voodoo still happens, especially in Haiti. That's one of the countries where voodoo is still quite common. Much of the culture is involved in it and buys into it. But Jesus became a curse. For as it is written in the Jewish law, cursed is everyone who, hangs, who is hanged on a tree. And it says in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13 that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. But now let's talk a little bit about what the cross has become. The cross of Christ has become a memorial. We have lots of different kinds of memorials that fam we're familiar with, and I'm going to just pull up one for a particular reason. Here's Grandma's memorial. This is not my grandma's memorial. But this is a memorial of someone who we're close to, a personal memorial, someone who loved us and whom we love. And in some ways, the cross is that, isn't it? It's a memorial of someone who loved us and someone we love. 
someone who loved us first and whom we love in return, and someone who causes us to love others. And so Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2, after telling us all the things we are because of what Jesus has done for us in the first three chapters of the book of Galatians, he, he goes on to say, so then, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But there are other kinds of memorials. This is a memorial of someone that we generally think of as being pretty important. The Washington Memorial in Washington, D.C. And Jesus' death, of course, was a death not just of anyone, not just of someone close, but also of someone who is very important. In fact, you could say, safely say that he was the most important person who ever lived. Why? Because he wasn't just a person, he was also God. He was God before he was a human. And so we read in Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, where it says, Have this mind among, our, our, among yourselves, which, are your, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, the death of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So here you have someone who was as high as they could possibly be, who lowered himself to the point of being as low as he could possibly be for us. So unlike the Washington Monument, Washington died just like the rest of us died, but he didn't die for any of us. And he was high, but he wasn't God. And he'll never be God. As much as people might try to make him God, he'll never be God. But God came in the flesh and died for us, lowering himself to the point of servant beneath us, the highest to the lowest, and the cross is a reminder of that. There's another kind of memorial yet that we can think of when we think about Jesus. You know what this is? This is, the, of course, the New York City skyline, and in the back, those two lights that represent the Twin Towers. This is the 9-11 memorial. And it not only represents the people who died in the towers, but it also represents those who died in order to save those in the towers. And this, in a way, is like the cross. The cross of Jesus represents someone who died to save someone else and that someone else was you and me for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing but to those who are saved being saved it is the power of god it was by the cross that jesus saved us did you know that all those images are buried within this simple cross of two pieces of wood? But it's more than that. It's more than that. There are more images that are found within the cross. To the Jews, this would have been very meaningful the death of a lamb. Now this could be a Passover lamb or it could be 
a lamb that was slain on the day of atonement. And in either case, it would be the death of a lamb, of an innocent lamb, in order to represent the taking away the blood, taking away the sins of the people. But it gained new meaning at the cross when after the cross, three days later, there was an empty tomb. And so now the cross isn't just an end of life. It's also the beginning of new life for Christians. And after death, it's the access to new life in the life to come. And so we read these verses in Revelation where he says, among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Do you see the contrast within those words? Standing as though it had been slain. Now if it's slain, it's not standing, is it? If it's standing, it hasn't been slain. So this, there's an inherent contrast in this lamb, this is a different kind of a lamb. It's not just a lamb that, that atones for sins of the people and offers forgiveness. This is a lamb that offers eternal life because after this lamb died, you, can't, you can live forever with his help. And that's also an image that we find connected to the cross. So it's no surprise to us anymore that we wear, these crosses are everywhere, aren't they? I don't know if you all noticed it or not. On the other side of that curtain, if you drive by the building from the front, a lot of people have been meeting in this building for 20 years, never noticed that there's a cross out there. The window, the front window of the building's in the shape of a cross. You know, this, this is a, was kind of a cookie cutter building that, that was bought, the plans were bought and and it was erected here. We don't have a lot of symbols of cross in our building, but we have one. Church buildings all over the world. Cemeteries all over the world. Jewelry. I walked up to a woman in China that was wearing a little necklace one time, and I said, hey, I, I like your cross. Are you a Christian? And the interpreter said, don't even bother asking her that. She has no idea why she's wearing that. She didn't know what it meant. She just thought it was a pretty little gold trinket. And everybody's wearing them, right? It's such a simple little delicate, nice character. Had no idea the depth of meaning that that cross carried. Well, this morning we're going to partake of emblems. And uh, there's no cross here on this table but that cross represents a passageway through death and into life that the scriptures talk about. God raised Jesus up, loosing him from the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And if it wasn't possible for him to be held by it, then it would be impossible for his people to be held by it, who have faith in him and who enter into death and who have this cross as a passageway, not only from death to life, but as a pathway of reconciliation. For in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Crosses reconciliation. It's a passageway that spans the gap that was created by our sin and draws us near to God. And so we have these emblems this morning to remind us of the death of Christ. And Christ asked us before he died to do this in remembrance of him until he comes again. And we'll do that this morning if the men who are serving us will please come forward at this time.